What does the future hold for mankind? Is it an existence of luxury and ease? Will advances in science and technology take us to new heights and bridge the gap between nations? For those who believe that man is the ultimate force in the universe, that's the party line. But what does the Bible have to say about tomorrow? Prophetic words written thousands of years ago and taken from the most accurate source the world has ever known, the Bible. But one piece of information is missing. When will this fate befall the earth and its inhabitants? God's inspired word contains many clues to that mystery. The Bible describes the days of Noah when people would be scoffers as a prediction of his coming in the end times. And it also describes catastrophic events from earthquakes to pestilences to the earth groaning. In fact, that is happening now. Yet how much does the average Christian really know about the future God has planned for us? And frankly, why should we care? In our modern world of relative ease and comfort, why should we pay attention to these ancient words? God has a plan for mankind, and it isn't just filled with tribulation and destruction. It's absolutely critical that Christians know what the Bible says about the days leading up to Christ's return. Because Jesus himself said these days would be filled with deceit. We've got to be prepared so we can identify the false teachers, false prophets, and even the Antichrist himself. Almost 30% of the Holy Scriptures are devoted to prophecies about the end times and God's final judgment. Yet in churches across America, the end times are hardly mentioned. Is Christ's church dangerously unprepared for His return? Your host for this program is Dr. Randall Price, an author of over 20 books and one of America's foremost prophecy scholars. Many Bible scholars believe strongly we may well be living in the final days. What leads them to this conclusion? An obscure interpretation of some cryptic Bible verses? Or could it be something much more obvious? Is it possible that the newspaper headlines and TV news stories we see every day are filled with signposts all Christians should be looking for? What will happen to Christ's church in the final days of immense suffering and tribulation? Will we be taken up before the darkest hours begin? Or will we be expected to endure the most terrible of days, time when God's wrath will be poured out on the earth? Jesus proclaimed that no man knows the day or the hour when these things will occur. Yet he told his disciples to watch for the signs. When we come back, we'll look for these all-important clues. What if you were given a newspaper in which you could read about tomorrow's headlines today? It might seem interesting, but not all that important. But what if the newspaper contained details about the biggest story of all time? More than that, what if it told of destruction, disaster, directly affect you and your family? And what if that prophetic paper could help save you and your loved ones? Certainly you'd pour over every detail, maybe even commit it to memory. What many Christians fail to realize is the Bible they hold in their hands every day is itself filled with end times prophecies and headline grabbing predictions of our future. And it may just be the future is here. Matthew chapter 24 is one of the most important passages in the Bible concerning the future of mankind. Here we find the disciples asking Jesus, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Well, when Jesus talked about the signs of the times, uh, his disciples hung on his every word. That was a different thing with the Pharisees. He warned them. And what he said was, as we have in Matthew 16, 3, you know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. Today, much of society finds itself in the same position as the Pharisees. Facing what many believe to be the end times or last days, people everywhere aren't sure what to believe. Confusion sets in when we compare a world rich in technology and luxury undreamed of even 50 years ago with the grim reality of the end time prophecies, some of them thousands of years old, that are apparently being fulfilled all around us. The Christians have an advantage over the world. They have God's Word to guide them. And while God's Word has not changed, the ability of man to understand some of these ancient predictions has. At the dawn of the 21st century, the picture seems to be coming into sharper focus. Time and time again, we see examples of how uh, the Bible predicts history before it happens. 
In fact, eventually, everything that the Bible prophesies comes to pass. God has had a plan for mankind since before the world began. From the beginning of time until today, that plan has been moving toward completion. And one day, God has promised to bring to a close this chapter in the human drama. But how will this happen? The Bible predicts three periods of time to come. The first is a seven-year period of death and destruction, the likes of which the world has never seen. It is called the Tribulation, and Jesus said that without God's intervention, no flesh would survive it. Following the Tribulation, Christ will return to earth and usher in a thousand-year period of peace on earth. This is called the Millennium. Finally, there is the Eternal Realm. Those who have chosen to accept God's free gift of salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ, will spend eternity in heaven. Those who have not will exist forever in hell. The question for mankind today is simply this, how much time do we have left? In Daniel 9, there's a prophetic timetable uh, that's divided into seven groups of 70 years for a total of 490 years. That clock began ticking with the command to rebuild Jerusalem after its destruction by Babylon. And it stopped when Christ rode into Jerusalem and announced himself as Messiah. The time, exactly 483 years to the day. The prophetic clock stopped at the appointed time and Daniel describes a gap between those 483 years and the final seven years of the prophetic timetable. During that gap, what was then prophetic, the crucifixion and resurrection, the destruction of the temple and dispersion of the Jewish people has now been confirmed in history and we're looking for the clock to begin ticking once again. When will the 70th and final week of the countdown begin? According to many Bible scholars, sooner than we think, perhaps even in this generation. They base that belief on one key event, something that was predicted by biblical prophets thousands of years ago and came to pass in 1948. Who has ever heard of such a thing? Who has ever seen such things? Can a country be born in a day or a nation be brought forth in a moment? Yet no sooner is Zion in labor than she gives birth to her children. When it comes to accuracy, no one can hold a candle to the biblical prophets. The record of prophetic utterance is so far unblemished by any failure. Not surprisingly, those prophecies have concerned the fate of Israel. And as history can now attest, one of the most difficult prophecies to fulfill came to pass as the entire world watched. 2,600 years ago, the prophet Ezekiel received a vision from God in which Israel as a people was viewed as a scattering of dead bones. I will gather them from all around and bring them back into their own land. I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. There will be one king over all of them, and they will never again be divided into two kingdoms. This prophecy in Ezekiel is one of the most remarkable and specific found in the Bible, and many of us living today have watched this come to pass. The long and tumultuous history of the nation of Israel included a period of some 1,700 years in which the Jews were scattered throughout the world, and Israel basically ceased to exist. However, Israel was still able to maintain its identity even after being removed from its homeland. Its reforming was truly a miracle and an infallible sign of the end times. Ezekiel describes a scene of skin and bones rattling and breath coming into these bones. He describes a scene of a holocaust the only scene that you could possibly uh, find to compare it with is the Holocaust in Germany. Indeed, it was a Holocaust, but Ezekiel describes something else. He describes not only the catastrophic pain and suffering of the Jewish people, but he describes a regathering and breath being brought into them and a nation being born out of it. In fact, that happened prophetically through an act of God on the 14th of May, 1948. Biblical scholars agree that the reestablishment of Israel was a key prophecy that had to be fulfilled in order for the rest of the Bible's end time predictions to fall into place. But what happens next? I tell you the truth. 
this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Is the existence of the nation of Israel really a signal that the end time prophecies are about to be fulfilled? Perhaps even in our own generation. While some Christians take a keen interest in these matters, many Christians find it easier to avoid the subject altogether. Perhaps they find the ancient prophecies too confusing, or they believe that if they're granted in their faith, they don't need to know the specifics of what the Bible predicts will happen in the final days. But is this dangerous ground? The disciples asked Jesus in Matthew 24, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus said, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. False Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Satan has always used false teachers to distort the truth, but the Bible says that deception will continue to increase as the end times approach. The climax of all this, of course, will be the arrival of the Antichrist. That's why it is so important for God's people to be well informed about what the future holds for this world. If the reestablishment of Israel marked a turning point, can we assume that the prophetic clock has already begun its final countdown? Or are there other signs we should be looking for? And will these signs be centered around Jerusalem? Or might America play a key role in God's grand plan? It seems not a day goes by that we don't see some story about Jerusalem, Israel, or the turmoil in the Middle East as a whole dominating the news headlines. But as far as Christians are concerned, there is one particular headline that we should be watching for, a signal that, according to the Bible, will begin the final countdown to Christ's return. It involves the most hotly disputed piece of real estate in the entire world, Jerusalem's Temple Mount. According to the Bible, the Middle East crisis will continue to grow until it threatens the peace of the whole world. This will bring a world leader to the forefront who will be welcomed with open arms. He is the Antichrist. He will make a strong covenant with the people of Israel and bring a peace to the region, but this will only be temporary under his protection, the temple will be rebuilt in Jerusalem, and the Mosaic laws of offerings and sacrifice will be reinstated. According to the prophet Daniel, the minute the Israeli leader and the Antichrist sign this pact, the great time peace will begin ticking once again. Seven years of tribulation are then allotted before the final battle of Armageddon. The Temple Mount in Jerusalem is one of the holiest sites on the planet for three great religions, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. It is the site of the temple where Jesus taught, the place from which the Muslims claim Muhammad ascended into heaven, and the sacred site of ancient Jewish sacrifice and the holiest of holies. But today the only buildings on this site are the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the elaborate Dome of the Rock. In terms of end times prophecy, this presents a real problem because the Old Testament prophet Daniel, the apostles Paul and John, and even Jesus himself, predicted the temple would be rebuilt on this very site. We know the temple will be rebuilt either before the tribulation begins or soon thereafter, because the Bible prophecies tell us it will be incomplete operation by the middle of the tribulation when it will be desecrated by the Antichrist. That means the Antichrist will set himself up in the temple and demand to be worshipped as God. Given the extremely volatile relationship between the Arab world and Israel, how likely is it that the Jews would attempt to rebuild their temple on what is today the third holiest site in the Muslim world? The answer may surprise you. It's more likely than you might think. The Jews actually took temporary possession of the temple site during the Six-Day War in 1967. Strangely enough, the Israelis captured this territory during that conflict, but the general in charge, a man named Moshe Dayan, decided to give the Muslims control over this spot as a conciliatory gesture. The bottom line is that once this coveted land is in their hands, they will not only rebuild the temple, but they will be able to resume temple sacrifices very quickly. 
thus fulfilling the end times prophecy. If the Jewish people attempted to take back the Temple Mount today, tear down the mosque that stands there, it might very well be the start of World War III. So how could this prophetic requirement ever be fulfilled? The Antichrist bears this title because so many people will be fooled by him and will worship him as Jesus Christ returned to earth. He will bring peace and prosperity to the earth and do many seemingly impossible things, such as brokering a deal between the Jews and the Arabs to rebuild the Jewish temple on the Temple Mount. The mere mention of the word apocalypse strikes fear into the hearts of many people. Are we headed for a period of death and destruction beyond imagination? Could it be that we who are alive today might actually see this come to pass? In the book of Matthew, Jesus' disciples asked the Lord what signs would appear to tell them the end is near. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Just as a woman experiences labor pains before giving birth, so Jesus has described the period in time leading up to the tribulation as one of increasing conflict. Are we seeing the fulfillment of this prophecy even today? Since 1960, there has been a war of some dimension somewhere almost constantly. But it is that area of the world we now call the Middle East that was of the most interest to the ancient prophets. Significantly, it is that same geographical area that today occupies the headlines. The always volatile Middle East produced the Six-Day War. In 1973, the Yom Kippur War, the First Gulf War, and now the Second Gulf War, in which the U.S. and much of the world are still engaged. What makes these wars different? Why are so many religious scholars convinced the 21st century will produce the setting for the last great battle, the Battle of Armageddon? Wars in the past, for the most part, have been devised by men to gain money or power or territory. But recently, almost inexorably, wars have been fought more for a spiritual reason. During World War II, Hitler established an occult ministry in the Third Reich to use satanic rituals against the Jews and the rest of the world. But the material destruction throughout Europe pales in comparison to the human and moral costs of the Holocaust. Yet today the world stands on the brink of an even more devastating battle as the sons of Ishmael pointedly threaten the sons of Isaac with extinction in what they describe as a holy war. In fact, the Islamic terrorists have now extended the threat to the entire non-Muslim world. It is hard to believe, but once again, tiny Israel, the nation that was brought into existence in a single day in 1948, is at the center of the conflict. Israel awakens every day with the realization that her neighbors are committed to the destruction of the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. So Israel has to look at the whole threat from Iran in a different perspective, because the Iranian president has stated specifically that he wants to wipe Israel off the map. Does the mere fact that conflict continues to exist in the Middle East mean we're on the brink of Armageddon? Many people, Christians included, believe this to be true. In fact, they believe this is what the Bible teaches. But is this correct? You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nowadays, all we have to do is turn on our televisions to realize that the Lord is certainly speaking to us. The wars and rumors of wars that we hear so much about are the signs of the end times. Uh, these are things that Jesus said would happen. But Jesus himself said the end is still to come. Perhaps this means that we should be looking for the opposite of war, that is peace in the Middle East. The Antichrist is the one who will be able to bring this about. And when this happens, we'll know the end will be near. Famine has also become very familiar to the world, along with the disturbing power and frequency of natural disasters, such as earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, hurricanes, and even tsunamis. It should come as no surprise to Christians that the Bible predicts just such a turn of events. But even those who are unaware of the biblical prophecies can see the evidence of their fulfillment in headlines around the globe. Hurricanes, earthquakes, volcanic activity, tsunamis. Right now we're seeing some of the most destructive geophysical forces in recorded history. The Pakistan earthquake in terms of loss of human life could very well be the most devastating ever. 
Here in the United States, scientists are beginning to pay more attention to the volcanic wonder we call Yellowstone National Park. Actually, the park is situated within a caldera, our opening of what was once a gigantic volcano more than 50 miles across. People tend to forget that all of this scenic beauty sits on top of 2,400 cubic miles of volcanic magma. That's about 5,000 times the amount that was ejected during Mount St. Helens 1980 eruption. This sleeping giant has recently shown signs of awakening, and it is a terrifying prospect if it should blow its lid. Living in a country like America, it's sometimes difficult to imagine the kind of destruction the Bible speaks of ever coming to pass. Yet as we've seen, the possibilities are there, just below the surface. There's no doubt something is going on, but are these really the signs of the times that Jesus spoke of? or simply a surge in Earth's natural cycle of such events. Many of the most respected Bible scholars in the world believe that we are truly seeing the very signposts Jesus spoke of. Does this mean that the tribulation, the worst period of death, destruction, and moral decay the world has ever seen, might just be about to begin? And if it is possible that the end is near, where will Christians be when these awful days fall upon the world? Interestingly enough, the strange turn of events in the natural world have not gone unnoticed by the modern scientific community. What do they have to say about our planet's unusual behavior? Could it be that science has taken a seat at the prophetic table? Many people, even some Christians, find it difficult to believe the ancient biblical prophets could have so accurately predicted events occurring today. The evidence of Earth's violent activity is just one example. But what about society as a whole? Are sociologists and anthropologists finding a similar destructive pattern? And does the Bible predict such a trend during the end times? The Apostle Paul, writing from prison to his protege Timothy, said, There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. Today his warning sounds all too familiar. The final age of this world is to be a time of troubles. Men will love nothing but money and self. They will be arrogant, boastful, and abusive with no respect for parents, no gratitude, no piety, no natural affection. They will be implacable in their hatreds, scandal mongers, intemperate and fierce, strangers to all goodness, traitors, adventurers, swollen with self-importance. They will be men who put pleasure in the place of God, men who preserve the outward form of religion, but are a standing denial of its reality. So these men, deny the truth. They have lost the power to reason and cannot pass the test of faith. You don't have to look far to see that this description is consistent with our contemporary culture. Skeptics, of course, will say that Paul's words could describe the social conditions in almost any age. That may be true to some degree, but is it possible that as this generation continues to push the moral boundaries further and further, we find ourselves closer than ever to fulfilling the conditions Paul described? When you look at the older generations, they married younger, they didn't have premarital sex, we didn't have abortion. But when you look at the kids who are now getting married today, they're getting married older, they had uh, a tremendous amount of, of sex and abortion, venereal disease, including AIDS. The previous generations in high school, their biggest problems were gum chewing, cutting in the line, where you fast forward two generations and all of a sudden it's drugs, sex, money, violence, and they're navigating a minefield. The signs seem to be all around us. Even modern science finds itself confirming the predictions of the ancient prophets. But there are other prophetic passages that are not so straightforward. One especially perplexing example can be found in the book of Isaiah and its subject matter takes us to one of the oldest societies on earth. Few things in biblical literature are as prevalent as Egypt. Hagar, Sarah's handmaiden, was an Egyptian. Moses was raised as an Egyptian prince, and it was Egypt who kept the children of Israel in bondage for 400 years. Joseph and Mary took the baby Jesus and fled into Egypt when he was threatened by Herod. And in modern times, it was Egypt that launched the first assault on the new nation of Israel. Could it be that Egypt has a role to play in the final apocalypse. There is an obscure verse in the book of Isaiah, which has baffled commentators for many years. Speaking of the last days, Isaiah says, in that day, there shall be an altar to the Lord in the middle of the land of Egypt and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. 
Interestingly, there is only one spot that fits the description of being in the middle of Egypt and at the border at the same time, and that is where the Great Pyramid of Giza now stands. The reference would seem to place the altar and the monument in different places, on the border and in the middle of the land. So how do we come to the conclusion that the Great Pyramid is the fulfilment of that prophecy? As it turns out, the Great Pyramid of Giza is the only monument that fits this qualification, but only if we have an understanding of ancient geography. The Great Pyramid lies at the apex of the triangle created by the Nile Delta. But in ancient times, Egypt was divided into two countries, Lower Egypt or the Delta and Upper Egypt. The Great Pyramid sits precisely on this border. Yet this is also the center of the land of Egypt, when the two ancient countries are viewed as one. There is yet another proof that Isaiah's riddle may have been solved. The pyramid's place on the border is further defined by its designation as the Great Pyramid of Giza. Giza, in fact, means border. But the question still remains, how could the Great Pyramid of Egypt be an altar to the Lord? Archaeologists, geologists, mathematicians and scientists of all kinds have probed and measured and studied the Great Pyramid in great detail, but they have yet to come up with a simple answer as to what is its purpose. Even though Egyptologists maintain that the Great Pyramid was nothing more than a burial tomb for the Pharaoh Khufu, the fact of the matter is, no mummy, no body of any kind has ever been found in any pyramid. Even its designation as Khufu's tomb has been questioned. Ancient Egypt preserved complex beliefs concerning the creation of the world in the little-known Edfu building texts carved into the walls of the Edfu temple in Upper Egypt. These hieroglyphics speak of the builder gods who set out the plans and foundations for all the future pyramids and temples. Who were these builder gods? Just a figment of the Egyptian imagination? Or could they have been actual living beings? The answer may lie in the Old Testament. I think we should take another, more literal look at these hieroglyphics. Certainly they portray giants who are clearly in charge of whatever activity is going on. Could it be that these giants are none other than the offspring of the Nephilim, the fallen angels of Genesis 6, which were thrust down to earth with Lucifer? The scripture describes them as men of great renown as well as giants. Only they had the knowledge, skill and power to create an edifice that would serve as a replica of the heavenly Jerusalem from which they had just been evicted, with its gleaming polished limestone surface and gold capstone. But why would the Nephilim, or fallen angels, be interested in building an altar to the Lord? At first glance, this question seems to discount the possibility that the Great Pyramid might fulfill Isaiah's cryptic prophecy. But Dr. Heron has an interesting theory that may well explain this difficulty. There is no question that the Great Pyramid is a truly unique and remarkable, some would say miraculous structure, certainly worthy of being an altar and pillar to the Lord. And it is here that the prophecies, scripture and the ancient texts come together to solve one of the great enigmas of the ages. In chapter 21 of the book of Revelation, John describes a future city, the New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven to earth. John describes this future city, the New Jerusalem, in great detail. Its brilliance was like a precious jewel, and the angel measured it with a golden rod. We are told of all the various stones it's made out of. We are told it has 12 gates made out of a single pearl each, and that the river of life flows out from the midst of it, etc. And at the end of this detailed description, John gives us the dimensions of this future city, and he says its length and its breadth and its height are the same. In today's measurements, that would be 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles high, and 1,500 miles wide. This measurement has led many scholars to believe that the New Jerusalem is a cube, but there is one other geometric model that fits the criteria, and this is a pyramid. So when these fallen angels fell to earth some five and a half thousand years ago in the dim distant past, they built this incredible pyramid with all the mathematics and the incredible engineering that it entails, and they built this as an earthly representation of the celestial city that they had come from. But they built it as a monument to their own pride and their own ego and their own hubris. Taking all the evidence into account, 
it seems clear that the Great Pyramid of Giza is an earthly representation of the future New Jerusalem, the heavenly city which is to come down out of heaven from God. Throughout the centuries, another biblical end times prophecy has raised eyebrows, as people of faith have wondered how it might ever be fulfilled. And something like a huge mountain, all ablaze, was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned to blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. How likely is it that something like a flaming mountain will be cast into the sea? Surprisingly, perhaps, through the magic of technology, most of us today have actually witnessed a similar event in our solar system. As the fragments of Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 slammed into Jupiter, we saw phenomenal explosions. Great dark spots were left, like bruises, across the face of Jupiter. And that grabbed a lot of people's attention when we saw that the areas of those bruises were four or five times the surface area of the Earth. We have to ask the question, what would have happened if it had been the Earth in the firing line? The impact that formed Shikshalup Crater was truly catastrophic. The amount of energy released was the equivalent of 10,000 times the nuclear arsenal of humanity. That's all American and Russian bombs put together. At ground zero, that blew the whole atmosphere away. After the impact, a gigantic fireball wrapped around the globe. Billions of tons of molten and vaporized shattered rock were propelled skyward. As recently as 1996, an asteroid about a third of a mile wide passed within 280,000 miles of Earth, a hair's breadth by astronomical standards. Had it hit the Earth, it would have caused an explosion in the 5,000 to 12,000 megaton range, over a thousand times greater than the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima, Japan. Near misses of the Earth occur uncomfortably frequently. In fact, every year, we believe, an object with more energy than that of the largest nuclear weapon ever tested misses the Earth by a lesser distance than that to the Moon. The Earth has been hit many times in the past by asteroids and comets. We've got a long history. We can tell that from the craters. That may be millions of years before the next time we get hit by an asteroid, but it may be tomorrow. For people with no hope for the future, these dire predictions are too frightening to consider. But those who have their hope in Christ know God not only has an eternal plan, but that their eternal future is positive and it's in His hands. Yet with all that's going on around us, we can't help but wonder, are we living in the last generation? And if we are, will Christ's church remain on earth to see all these end time prophecies fulfilled? Some say yes, but others have a different perspective. Could it be that Christians will be spared from some of these dark days by being taken out in an event called the rapture? Or will we miss the tribulation entirely? If you know even a little about end time Bible prophecy, you know the experts disagree on one very crucial point. When will the church be called up to meet Christ in the air? This event, commonly referred to as the rapture, has been placed by various experts at different points in the prophetic timeline. Some say it will happen before the great tribulation spoken of in the book of Revelation. Some predict it will occur in the middle of this terrible seven-year period. And others insist it must come after the tribulation has taken place. Now you may be asking yourself, does the timing really matter? Well, the more you know about these dark days, the more you'll understand why it matters very much. Think about man's worst inhumanities to man in modern times. Genocide in Uwanda, billions killed during the Pol Pot regime in Cambodia, and of course the Nazi Holocaust in Germany in which millions of Jews were killed. Take a deep breath and realize that the tribulation will be worse, much worse, than all of these things combined. It all begins with the Antichrist, a wolf in sheep's clothing who will convince the world that he alone can usher in world peace, yet ultimately will bring destruction and damnation. In the book of Revelation, the Apostle John writes about this dark figure as seen in a vision he received from God. I looked and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow and he was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. The Antichrist is the first of four horsemen of the apocalypse that will appear in the end times. Many people will be deceived by the Antichrist, and especially those who are unaware of what the Bible says about the end times. For those who do not know God's Word, it is clear that when the Antichrist arrives on the scene, he will come as a man of peace. He will be very attractive, and he will seem to solve the world's problems. He is the counterfeit Christ, 
And many people will worship him thinking that he is the Messiah, but he's not. And those people will be deceived by him. The Bible tells us that the world will put their trust in this charismatic leader in hopes of finally achieving world peace. Use it in internationally recognized bodies such as the United Nations. He will establish a one world government. As a result, nations will relinquish their own power to become subservient to him. God's word also reveals that the Antichrist totalitarian regime will use political, religious, and economic pressure to control every person on earth. The Antichrist will become a global dictator, and when the time is right, he will take control of the world's commerce to the point where no one will be able to buy or sell anything without taking his dreaded mark of 666. Some people see the framework for the one world government and a cashless society already taking shape. More and more we are moving away from paper and coin money and using plastic and barcodes to not only transact business but to convey information about each transaction to entities that track business trends. Whether or not this is the system the Antichrist will eventually use the Bible warns us that anyone who takes the mark of the beast is doomed to spend eternity in hell. Yet anyone who refuses the mark will be hunted down and killed. The remaining three horsemen spoken of in the book of Revelation unleash increasingly terrible events. The red horseman carries a large sword and represents war. He is given the power to take peace from the earth. Many scholars believe he represents a conflict that will bring death to earth on a massive scale. He is World War III, chemical warfare, and a nuclear holocaust all rolled into one. The third horseman rides a black horse and symbolizes the famine and disease that often follow in the wake of war. But the fourth rider is the worst of them all. I looked and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague and by the wild beasts of the earth. When this begins, we may see as much as one quarter of our population, well over a billion people die as a result. And if the conflict goes to the level of nuclear warfare, then the nuclear fallout and mass destruction could easily render land that was once fertile into a wasteland with famine being the end result. When we consider the verses in Revelation 6, it's important to remember that the rider of the pale horse named Death is followed close behind by Hades. That's significant because it means that those slain are unbelievers, for upon death, believers do not go to Hades, but straight to the Savior's side. This brings us to one of the most contentious points in apocalyptic teaching. Will Christians be left on earth to endure the horrors of the four horsemen and their tribulation? Or will Christ return for his church before this time and take us to be with him? In the words of the best-selling book series, will there be some left behind? One of the most compelling events in the Bible is called the rapture of the church. And the apostle Paul talks about this event in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. For the Lord himself will descend from the heavens with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Christians the world over look forward to this amazing day. But can we be sure it will take place before the tribulation? The most knowledgeable theologians and Bible scholars disagree on this very point. Paul wrote these prophetic verses in answer to a question he received from the people of the church in Thessalonica. The people wanted to know if some of their loved ones who had already died would be a part of the second coming of Christ. Paul's answer not only explained to them that the dead in Christ would rise first, it went a step further in chapter 5. Paul tells the Thessalonians, God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, 
In chapter 1 of the book, he refers to Jesus as the one who delivers us from the wrath to come. And in the book of Revelation, Jesus himself promises to deliver us when he says, because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. With the terrifying descriptions the Bible offers of the tribulation period, it's comforting for Christians to believe that we will not have to endure this frightening reality. But is this really the case? After World War II, William B. Harrison developed what has been called the mid-tribulational view of the rapture. That view teaches that Christians will go through the first half of the tribulation, which is a time of peace. God's wrath being poured out in the second half of the tribulation, and that Christians will be spared from that. So that places the rapture in the middle of the tribulation, approximately about the time that the Antichrist uh, is revealed himself as being who he is and sets himself up to be worshiped to God in the Jewish temple. Will Christians be spared from the worst of the tribulation nightmare? Another theory, which holds to a post-tribulation time frame for Christ's return, says Christians will remain on earth for the entire seven years. Those who believe in a post-tribulational view of the rapture have several key points to their argument. They ask, why would God give us so much information about the end times and about the tribulation? Why would he have his prophets write out in detail what will take place? Why would Jesus himself tell us in Mark chapter 13 that false Christ and false prophets would appear and perform signs and miracles to deceive even the elect if that was possible? Why would all this be true if Christians are not going to be here to experience this for themselves? They believe that many people will be deceived by the false Messiah or the Antichrist because They've been taught to believe that the church will be raptured before the tribulation begins. So they will see this very attractive figure appear on the world scene and assume that he is the Christ. The reason that the Lord has given us so much information about the tribulation is for the benefit of those who will be living through that period of time. And that means those who will be left behind after the rapture so that they will be able to discern the times and know what is happening on earth. If even the experts disagree on when the rapture will take place, can we at least pinpoint when the tribulation will begin? And if Christians are here at this time, will we be able to recognize that great dark figure of biblical prophecy, the Antichrist, when he arrives on the scene? Living in a country as blessed and free as America, a future so bleak is hard to imagine. But that raises another question. What role will America play in the last act of the drama? Will the United States side with the forces of God or the armies of Satan? And when will the great and final conflict of mankind take place, the Battle of Armageddon? At the start of the 21st century, the ancient past is always at hand to remind us of God's eternal truths. In the Megiddo prison complex in Israel, a prisoner was removing rubble from the planned site of a new ward when his shovel uncovered the edge of an elaborate mosaic, revealing what many archaeologists are saying may be the Holy Land's oldest church. What's most exciting about this find is that it dates from the decades before Constantine legalized the church in A.D. 312. The mosaics there tell the story of a Roman officer and a woman named Achetus who donated money to build a church in the memory of the God, Jesus Christ. It's also interesting that the remains of the church were discovered near the plains of Armageddon, Megiddo, at a time when many religious scholars believe we're facing a very real possibility, the possibility of that last great battle taking place near this very spot. So how much time remains before the last great conflict begins? The great prophetic clock of the end time prophecy seems to be winding down to that very moment. The armies of the world will gather to fight the Battle of Armageddon. It'll be the bloodiest, most horrific battle in the history of mankind. Christ's second coming will stop the battle. All the world will witness his glorious return. He'll save Jerusalem and 
defeat the forces of the Antichrist. Following Christ's second coming, the Bible tells us that Jesus will institute a thousand year period of true world peace, the millennium. In essence, he will show the world what life on earth could have been like had mankind chosen to follow God from the beginning. According to the Bible, all of this will take place at the end of the tribulation. So then, when will the tribulation begin? The answer is simple. Nobody knows. Just as nobody knows when the rapture of the church will occur, Jesus tells us that no man knows the day or the hour. But God, in His wise providence, has designed the Bible prophecy in such a manner that the rapture has appeared imminent to Christians of every generation. Nothing is a better motivator than to believe Jesus could come at any moment. That's why Jesus also urged His disciples to be ready, so we too must be ready. Though we cannot know the exact timing of God's plan, He has given us all we need to know in the Bible. For example, the ancient prophecies are detailed enough to tell us of one key event that will begin the final countdown to the tribulation and ultimately to the battle of Armageddon. What's more, the Bible also tells us who the key players in this final battle will be, and their names are very familiar. According to the Bible, the Middle East crisis will continue to grow until it threatens the peace of the whole world. This will bring a world leader to the forefront who will be welcomed with open arms. He is the Antichrist. He will make a strong covenant with the people of Israel and bring a peace to the region. According to the prophet Daniel, the minute the leader of Israel and the Antichrist sign this pact, the great timepiece will begin ticking once again. Seven years of tribulation are then allotted before the final battle of Armageddon. Uh, the prophet Ezekiel talks about the time when nations from the north will come against Israel. Led by a prince named Gog, most people believe that's Russia, along with other nations, Persia, uh, which most people believe is Iran, Libya, Ethiopia, will come against the nation of Israel. John the Revelator adds considerable detail to Ezekiel's account. For example, John tells us the size of the army that will be assembled for the final battle is 200,000 thousand or 200 million men. John tells us he heard the number of them. There's only one country in the world that could field an army of 200 million people, and that is China. China now has a $70 billion oil contract with Iran, ancient Persia. They can veto an Iran nuclear bomb in the Security Council because they're permanent members and Russia is also a permanent member. China is moving in to become an economic world superpower and having enormous influence over Asia and over the world. They indeed will be that country that will field that army. The world, according to the prophets, scientists, and military experts, now appears to be politically and geographically aligned to see these prophecies fulfilled. What role, if any, will America play in all of this? Most people think of the United States as a strong ally to Israel, but has the U.S. unwittingly harmed Israel in the quest for peace in the Middle East? And if so, is there a price to be paid for these actions? America is married to two ancient brothers the Arab and the Jew, Ishmael and Isaac in prophecy. One marriage was because of black gold oil. The second marriage was over guilt, the death of six million Jews as America hardened its heart, closed its borders, and turned its head. There is absolutely no way out. The covenant that America cut with Ishmael over oil will not change. The covenant that America cut with Israel will not change. So America is in fact in the eye of the prophetic storm. With the rise of terrorism in the Middle East and the situation with the Palestinians getting more volatile day by day, the nation of Israel has become the focus of world attention.
1991, the President of the United States initiated the Madrid peace process. This plan was for Israel to give up land for peace. The land involved the West Bank, Golan Heights, Gaza, and specifically Jerusalem. The problem with the Madrid peace process is that God has promised the land of Israel to the Jewish people as in an everlasting covenant, and that the prophets mention that whoever divides this land will face judgment from God. In Zechariah chapter 14, the prophet says, in that day I will seek to destroy all the nations that have come against Jerusalem. Could it be that in its attempt to achieve such a worthy objective as peace in the Middle East, America has inadvertently put itself prophetically in harm's way? Has her peace initiatives caused her to come against Israel? I'm not a prophet, but I encourage you to read the prophets Zechariah and Joel, which clearly state that God will judge the nations that attempt to divide his covenant land. Matter of fact, the Bible speaks about in Genesis 12, 3, those nations or those people that bless the Jewish people will be blessed, and those who curse them will be cursed. The United States has experienced many, many years of blessing because we have been really the only nation in the world that is a true friend of the nation of Israel. However, in October of 1991, President George Bush and Mikhail Gorbachev, the Russian, prime, uh, Russian president, sponsored the Madrid Land for Peace Conference. And this was the beginning of many catastrophes and catastrophic events that affected the United States going forward. What happened is in Madrid is George Bush was talking about Israel giving up their land for promises of peace and security the perfect storm that had developed in the Northeast Atlantic was sending 30-foot waves into President Bush's Kennebunkport, Maine home. August 24, 1992, the Madrid Conference convened in Washington, D.C. On the very same day, Hurricane Andrew, the largest hurricane at that time in U.S. history, pummeled the state of Louisiana and Florida. This was a devastating storm that happened at the same time Israel's land was being discussed in meetings in Washington, D.C. On January 15, 1994, President Bill Clinton and Pre President of Syria Hafs Assad were in Geneva, Switzerland, calling on Israel to leave the Golan Heights. Within 24 hours, a major earthquake hit in the center of Northridge, California, producing the largest earthquake in U.S. history, and at that time, the second largest disaster in U.S. history. Many of us heard of and watched Israel leaving the city of Gaza. On August 24th, the day the final Jews were evicted from Gaza and northern Samaria, Tropical Storm Depression 12 formed near the Bahamas. Within 24 hours, it was Tropical Storm Katrina. Within 72 hours, it was Hurricane Katrina hitting southeast Florida. 72 hours later, Hurricane Katrina hit Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama, producing the largest disaster in U.S. history that dwarfs 9-11, Hurricane Andrew, and the Northridge earthquake in size and intensity. God has blessed America in innumerable ways, but it seems that he has clearly not forgotten his promises to Israel. Has America felt the wrath of God for the recent stance it's taken on the Middle East? Is God sending us a message through an uncanny sequence of natural disasters time to coincide with key events? There are biblical scholars who would say no, that we shouldn't make too much of what are merely coincidences. Nevertheless, the parallels are intriguing. But there is a bigger question to come from all this that each person must answer. Are you prepared for the prophetic events that are sure to come? Do you have a relationship with God through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ? Will you recognize the signs for yourself? As a child of God, we have nothing to fear of the end times. Deuteronomy chapter 32, God tells us that we are the apple of His eye. And therefore, we have nothing to fear of the Antichrist, of the events of the tribulation or the end times because we are a child of the living God. 
Well, I think for the average Christian, their response should simply be to all of this, look up for your redemption draweth nigh. In, indeed, what's happening in these days confirms and fulfills the reality and the validity of the scriptures and also points to a glorious event called the blessed hope, not hopelessness, but hope for the believer, and that's the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ for the church. So it's, for the believer, it's a wonderful uh, validation of something wonderful on the horizon. For the unbeliever, it's terrifying because it leads to acceleration of cataclysmic events uh, that will be much graver than the ones we're experiencing at this present moment. The Bible is the truth of God, so the better you know the scriptures, the better prepared you will be to withstand what is to come. Whether Christians are here for the tribulation or raptured before the terrible destruction begins, the daily reading of the scriptures, particularly the New Testament, is a must for every Christian. The world is a time bomb whose fuse has long since been lit. The hoofbeats of the four horsemen of the apocalypse are clearly to be heard by all those who have ears to hear. The bad news is the Titanic is going down. The good news is you don't have to get on it. For there's an escape route, there's a way out, there is an alternative. For we are promised that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus said, lift up your head when you see the signs and know that your redemption is drawing near. These are signs of hope and the assurance that the end times are a new beginning. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their